Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. How to survive hidden healthcare and hospital dangers with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo. Pat has over 20 years' experience as a professional public speaker, and for the next hour, she's going to be your healthcare and hospital survival guide. Each week, you will say, oh, as Pat exposes and explores little-known hospital hazards, delves into the deep waters of dangerous healthcare practices, picks the brains of her good-looking and influential guests, all guaranteed to keep you and your family safe in today's fragmented health care system. The Speak Up and Stay Alive radio program is intended to advance health literacy by making you aware of health care and hospital dangers. The program is for informational purposes only and is not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem or as a substitute for consulting a licensed medical professional. Participating as a program listener, guest, or caller should not be considered medical advice. References to any entity, product, service, website, or source of information should not be considered as an endorsement. And now you your host, Pat Rulo. I can't bear you no more, baby. I got too much to ride. But I, I, I don't survive. Hello, I'm Pat Rulo, and I'm so happy to host us this next hour, where I will serve you a generous helping of everything you need to know to help you and your loved ones stay safe during any doctor or hospital visit. People ask, who are you? Who am I? I am every person who has ever been in a hospital or a doctor's office and has received less than acceptable treatment. I am you, the person who got an infection during a simple outpatient procedure. I am you, the patient whose questions are ignored, who struggles to speak to the doctor as he or she has one foot out the door. I am the missed heart attack, the hospital-acquired infection, the wrong diagnosis, and the unanswered call button. This show is not about pointing a finger at hospitals, doctors, or nurses. It's not about a political agenda or party preferences. It's about you, your family, your friends, and your loved ones. It's about becoming informed of all the hospital hazards, what they are, how and why they happen, and what you can do about them. This show is about empowerment. It's about doing everything you can to stay safe during any and every healthcare encounter. Speak up and stay alive, radio. Yes, that's O-H with an exclamation point. Will cause you to say, oh, as each week we delve into little known hospital and healthcare dangers. When you understand why something happens, you are better equipped to do something to change it and prevent it from happening to you. If enough people begin speaking up, together, each of us can alter the current precarious path of today's unsafe healthcare practices. Well, as usual, we've worked diligently to bring little-known healthcare hazards to the forefront of today's show, and we're going to trick our guest into playing a little word association game with us. I'm sure he'll be a good sport. So get comfy and spend the best part of your day with us. But now, here's the Hospital Hazard of the Week. This is more of how to stay out of the hospital and avoid hazards that might land you in the hospital. And I'm talking about falls. Well, since I fell a few weeks ago, not due to any tricky maneuvers on my part, but rather a faulty set of stairs that collapsed as I got out of my kayak, that got me to think about hazards around the home that can sneak up on you without any warning. A person can be healthy and experience a fall and land in the hospital where he or she is then subjected to health care acquired infections and all kinds of non-fall related issues that can lead to some serious outcomes. And as the holidays approach, many of us will be visiting older friends and family, making it the perfect time to conduct a risk assessment, keeping an eye out for any potential for that person to fall. In fact, each year, One in every three adults ages 65 or older takes a fall. So here's a few ideas. Take a walk through the home with that person to recreate their day. Check the bed location in relation to accessible lamps or light switches. Is it difficult to reach the light switch that might encourage a fall? If so, add some portable switches. Those are light switches you can put anywhere, such as that instant switch as seen on TV. You just plug the receiver into the wall, plug your lamp in, and flip the portable switch from any location in the room. Most of them come with a plastic wall bracket that mounts to any wall with a removable adhesive strips. Or you can just set the switch on any flat surface with its built-in easel. And speaking of lights, look around for those areas that may lack illumination or cast shadows. Add additional lighting fixtures and those portable switches I just mentioned. 
and ask, what do you do in the middle of the night if you need to get to the bathroom? Is the path safe? Would they be better off with a portable toilet right next to the bed? And then check the bathroom. How do they get in and out of the tub or shower? And check the bath and shower grab bars and the toilet grab bars and reinforce them if they're weak. Ask questions. What would you do if the power went out and it was dark in the house? Then I'd supply key locations with flashlights and extra batteries. Place a flashlight where they watch TV, the bedroom, the bathroom, and make sure telephones are handy with a list of emergency numbers in a big enough font size to be seen without glasses and place a flashlight by those telephones. And then check frequently used areas like the kitchen and put frequently used items on lower shelves and get rid of step stools. Check the entire home for frayed or dangerous throw rugs and furniture located in the wrong places and make sure chairs are sturdy and not on rolling casters. So instead of sitting around munching on holiday cookies and falling asleep, take your loved one to Home Depot or Lowe's and look around for some of those handy and inexpensive items. Handheld and portable light switches, flashlights, extra batteries, light bulbs, sturdy casters for furniture legs. Those are great gift ideas and stocking stuffers. Use your holiday visiting time to help potentially save a loved one from a fall. Prevention is one of the easiest ways to reduce or avoid an unnecessary trip to the hospital. And with that, let's hear some legal news you can use. Recently, I hosted a presentation on the topic of advanced directives, and one of the participants told me that she was giving the gift of a health care power of attorney to everyone in her family, both young and old. And I thought, huh, what a great idea. So listen as I spend the next two minutes with John Thomas, an easy-to-talk-to attorney at Schraff & King, located on Psalm Center Road in Willoughby Hills, Ohio. I'm going to be talking about powers of attorney. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. John, what is a health care power of attorney? A health care power of attorney is a legal document which permits you to name an agent to make health care and medical decisions for you if you're incapacitated and unable to make those decisions for yourself. Who would need to have a health care power of attorney in place? I'd say anyone 18 years or older would need a health care power of attorney. A lot of people think it's just something you get when you're older or when you have health concerns, but I can tell you that you have a lot of young people coming in uh, 18 or 20, 22, asking for them too. And it, it's the kind of document that a lot of times you don't know you need it until it's too late. And if you're incapable of signing one, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get one at that point. So if someone's in the hospital, they're having a health care crisis, what happens if they do not have a health care power of attorney in place? If you don't have a health care power of attorney in place and you need to have someone make medical decisions for you because you're incapable, your only alternative is to get a guardianship and have that filed down at the court. I can tell you that's a more burdensome process and it has higher costs. So in the long run, to be prudent and have a health care power of attorney is really your best option. There is a difference between a health care power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Just explain that a little bit. Sure, there are two main types of powers of attorney. The first, health care, which is what I just explained. And the second type is a financial power of attorney, which is a document that's specifically tailored to each individual, and it allows them to name an agent to handle their financial needs, similar to the health care power of attorney, but it's only for finances. Many times people think if they have a health care power of attorney that that person now has the right to address some of their financial issues. They're two completely separate documents, but again, we normally counsel folks to look into getting both of them. If our listeners want more information about a health care power of attorney, how can they find out more about you and Schraff and King. Well, they can first go online to our website, www.schraffking.com, or they can contact us at our offices. The phone number is 440-585-1600. John, you've got lots of information for us. Thanks for sharing it today. Thank you. After the show, be sure to visit the website, speakupandstayalive.com, for more life-saving information. Plus, that is where you can purchase my book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide. Bring the book to the hospital with you. It's the best way to stand out and in a positive way. And remember, we donate two handmade pillowcases to either a troop member in Afghanistan or to a local veterans shelter for every book sold with your name on it as the donor. So for a mere $20, you benefit and so does some well-deserving warrior. And with the holidays around the corner, 
Don't send the routine shirt that doesn't fit or a plastic gizmo or gadget. Give a meaningful and a useful gift that really says, I care. Give the gift of healthcare safety. Purchase the book, the patient safety logs, and hey, throw in some icebreaker cards. It's a one-size-fits-all present that everyone needs. You can order online at speakupandstayalive.com or you can request by email at speak at speakupandstayalive.com or call me 440-725-5462. And now, back to the show. Today, we have our favorite and our in-house infection prevention guru, Daryl Hicks, author of the book, Infection Prevention for Dummies. He is also the director of environmental services at a 500-bed award-winning hospital and is nationally recognized as one of the industry experts in infection prevention and control as it relates to cleaning. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Good to be here. It's always a pleasure and a learning experience to talk with you, Daryl. And today, we're going to surprise you and ask you to join us in a little gamelet of sorts. If you, know, <laughs> <laughs> if you know us, Bob, Joe, and I play a fun game every week called Fear the Wheelchair. So we thought we'd include you in today's game of infection prevention for dummies, word association. Is that okay with you? Let's go. <laughs> Here's how it goes. Joe will read a word. Bob will say the first thing that pops into his head, and that could be dangerous. That's real dangerous. <laughs> and then so will I. And I think that's probably where the word dummies comes in. Oh. <laughs> then, Daryl, you can share some of your wisdom and advice as it pertains to that word. So is everybody, <laughs> is everyone ready? Go for it. All right. The first word is fungus. Fungus. Oh, I think of mushrooms. Ooh, and I think of athlete's foot. What about that, Daryl? Well, fungus is in the news lately, and it's related to these spinal injections that people got from this one mixing lab up in Massachusetts that's been cited since 2002 about problems with its processes. 38 people have died, and over 400 have been sickened. And it's because of the fungus that is growing inside of this mixing lab while fungus isn't usually a source of infections, in this case where it was injected into people's spinal cords, they came down with a fungal meningitis, and as a result, many people have been sickened, and many, almost 40 people have died. So while it's not normal, mold growing in your shower isn't the same as what's being injected into people's spinal cords. Fungus usually isn't a source of infections, but in this case, it was very dangerous. It's something to keep in mind. All right, the next word is actually two, hand sanitizer. Oh, I think of Purell. <laughs> yeah, and I think of alcohol. Well, a lot of hand sanitizers are alcohol-based, and Purell is one of those name-recognized products that you'll see in a lot of hospitals. And in our hospital, we do use Purell because I believe it's a very good product. But hand sanitizing isn't a replacement for hand washing. And as often as possible, people should be washing their hands. But if you think about healthcare workers who are touching patients and changing gloves maybe 50 times a day, if they wash their hands 50 times a day, their hands dry out and could cause other issues that could be an infection issue for that healthcare worker with dry, chapped hands, red hands. So hand sanitizers came along to uh, be that in-between hand washing. When you use hand sanitizer, you should put enough on your hands that it takes about 10 to 15 seconds to dry. If you do that and make sure you get under rings and other things that you may have on your wrist or your arms, then you'll do a good job of sanitizing your hands. But don't forget to wash your hands. Daryl, quick question on the uh, hand sanitizers. Say the sanitizers they sell at the drugstore, at the dollar store, are they the same as the Purell as far as the amount of active ingredient? Probably not. You want to look for something that's in the range of 65% alcohol in order for it to be a good hospital grade or health grade hand sanitizer. Some of the ones that you get buy off the store shelves, unless it's a name like Purell, then it may be something that's in the neighborhood of 50%. And that may not be enough to kill the organisms that you're going after. Good to know. Thank you. All right. The next one is biofilm. Ooh, what do you think of, Bob? 
Oh, that's what I do when I want to take a picture. <laughs> biofilm. Oh, no. I biofilm. <laughs> Biofilm. Oh, gosh, Joe's shaking his head, too. Um, when I think of biofilm, I think of damp and slimy. You're very close, Pat. Uh, <laughs> it happens in areas that do get wet a lot, like in restrooms around faucets and what have you. But common cleaners can't break through that film, and you actually need a little bit of uh, agitation. So that's where you keep a toothbrush handy. And remember to keep it separate. Keep it in your cleaning supplies. I want your husband using the toothbrush that you clean the sink with. But to get aggressive with that little bit of film that you see around faucets and drains, because that biofilm won't allow normal cleaners and disinfectants to get below it to actual germ killing. That biofilm kind of protects those little bad guys from the cleaners that you normally would use. So get aggressive with it, get a brush, and brush it loose, and then use your disinfectant to... uh, actually kill the guys great advice thanks all right this is a four-letter word that's a bad word not that bad oh no not on this show (laughs) show mrsa dirty (laughs) yeah it's quite dirty it's mrsa oh what do you think of bob i think it's a super bug um yeah i think of a staph infection you're all very close it's a very serious thing in fact that's how i got involved in infection prevention and cleaning is that my 37-year-old daughter-in-law actually died of what I believe was MRSA, and she was just working out in gyms at the time that she got it in the uh, the crease of her, her thumb, and within six weeks was dead. And so it is out there in the public. It's called Community Acquired MRSA. It's methicillin-resistant staph aurus, and used to be back in the 70s that only about 4% of the staph infections in hospitals were MRSA, and today it's more like 80% of those who are 65 or older, 80% of those staph infections are MRSA. And it is a superbug. We call it superbug because it is resistant to antibiotics. Methicillin is an antibiotic, and it's kind of the end of the line. And there is no stronger medicine than methicillin. And when you get an organism that is resistant to methicillin, there's really no cure for it. You will live with that condition. It may go into uh, kind of a a lull, but then it it can pop up and be active again. But if it gets into the bloodstream, it could be deadly. Okay, C. diff. What do you think of Bob? I think uh, every time I hear the word C. diff, I think of diarrhea. Well, yeah, and I think of antibiotics. C. diff is one of those things that does cause diarrhea and It is a spore, and you don't need to know a whole lot about spores other than most disinfectants, 98% of the disinfectants out there in the world today will not kill the C. diff spore. And so if that is a problem where you have a family member that has been diagnosed with C. diff and they're using the same bathroom that you are that to prevent protect yourself, you need to get a disinfectant. If you buy Clorox Ultra, which is like a 6.25% hypochloric acid, but it's called Clorox Ultra, and it actually has a registration against C. diff and will kill the C. diff. So in your home, if you're sharing restroom facilities with someone with C. diff to protect yourself, you need to buy a disinfectant that will kill that. But C. diff is causing... uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30,000 deaths a year and affects everyone from the very young. Uh, I know of an 18-month-old baby that died of C. diff all the way up to the elderly and everyone in between. So it's a serious public health problem. It's another one of those that you never get rid of. It may go dormant or it may be active, but it will always be with you. So, again, good hand washing and attention to glove protocol is important. And, Pat, just one tip. Uh, If you're dealing with C. diff, do not use hand sanitizers because they will not kill the C. diff spore. Soap and water don't kill it, but it floats it loose from your skin. Active washing and scrubbing and then rinsing will get rid of those spores from your hands. Thank you for mentioning that. Well, we already touched a little bit on this one, uh, hand washing. 
Ooh, what do you think of Bob? Patty taught me how to sing happy birthday twice. <laughs> you learned well. And I think of friction. Uh, hand washing is probably the front line defense against most common bacteria, germs, the things that uh, we touch, they're contaminated. So I know that a lot of people depend on the gloves that they wear, but gloves can get holes or tears in them, and they're imperfect in the manufacturing process, and it doesn't take a virus, uh, a very big opening, in order to get onto the hands. So if you see people changing gloves without washing their hands or using hand sanitizer in between, then beware because not only does it come through from the surface to their hands, but it can come from their hands through the gloves to uh, the outer surface of the gloves. So hand washing is the number one line of defense against infection. So do what your mom said, wash those hands. And sing happy birthday twice, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> If you're just finding us, we're in the middle of playing a super fun game called Infection Prevention for Dummies Word Association with your favorite expert, Daryl Hicks, who has all the answers when it comes to cleaning and avoiding infections, both in the hospital and out. So let's continue, guys. All right. Uh, here's another two-worder. Hospital gloves. Mm, what do you think of, Bob? I think of disposable. Yeah, they are. And I think of um, cross-contamination. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, uh, you three, because uh, <laughs> gloves can be a source of contamination. If, say, you come into a room, you wash your hands, you put on the gloves, and then you put the bed rail down, and someone didn't wash the bed rail, someone didn't disinfect the bed rail, they put the bed rail down, and then they're changing a dressing on the patient, a surgical dressing. They're touching that dressing with contaminated hands, even though they have done the proper gloving, if someone didn't do the job of sanitizing that surface, then clean gloves, sterile gloves, it doesn't matter if you touch a contaminated surface, you're picking up from that surface and then touching the dressing and an open wound uh, on the patient, which could be a source of infection. So um, pardon the pun, but Cleaning and hand hygiene and gloves all work hand in hand, mm. and uh, so you need both. You need the hand washing, the gloves, and then clean surfaces. Thank you. We didn't mind the pun. <laughs> uh, this is microfiber. What do you think of, Bob? I think about those microfibers when they stuck to my hand. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They're kind of creepy on your hands, but my words are efficient and effective. There is what I call the miracle of microfiber. And if you think about a terry cloth towel or washcloth or a towel and how much more absorbent they are than just a flat towel, that is a macrofiber. Those loops in a terry cloth are a macrofiber. But microfiber is, is very tiny, but it gives you pockets that soil can sit in and the microfiber will hold that soil and won't release it until it's washed. So it does a, a superior job over normal cotton uh, wipers like a washcloth or something. If you see people using washcloths to clean with, then that is not as good as microfiber because the microfiber will pick up upwards to 99.99% of the soil, and with that soil goes all the bad guys. So microfiber goes after greater soil collection and removal from the surface. And if you remove that soil from the surface, then there's not much left for the germs, the bacteria, the viruses that are left on that surface to live on. They need food and water to live. So if you remove their food and water source through a good microfiber, then they'll die on their own. Microfiber is a kind of a miracle cloth that does a very superior job of soil removal. So go after the microfiber. If you've got a choice between microfiber and a washcloth, go for the microfiber. I'm going to stock this radio station with microfiber cloths. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next word is bleach. What do you think of, Bob? Clorox, of course. <laughs> I think of a disinfectant. Mom and Pop's bleach isn't the same. <laughs> ABC bleach that you find on sale, uh, if you read the label, there's nothing on there about being a registered disinfectant. So 
Bleach is not a good cleaner. It is a uh, relatively good uh, disinfectant on pre-cleaned surfaces. But if you just use bleach as a general purpose cleaner, then you're missing the point because um, it would be much better if you did a good job of using a microfiber cloth to remove the soil, then you wouldn't need a bleach in order to kill the bacteria, the germs, the viruses. Not all bleaches are created equal, and you need to know which one you're using, but uh, Clorox is one of the companies that has gone after the EPA registration, which is essential for a registered disinfectant. You have to be careful with bleach because if you mix it with ammonia-containing products, it creates a uh, deadly gas. And you hear about schools being evacuated or workplaces being evacuated, and it's usually because someone has mixed bleach and ammonia-based products and has sickened a lot of people. You need to be careful with bleach, you know, all the problems with bleach, bleaching out your clothing, anything that it falls on, if it's fabric, it will remove the color. So just be careful with bleach and realize it has its limits. Good advice. Thank you. All right. This next one is what uh, you guys come in and wipe everything down with. Disinfectant wipes. <laughs> what do you think of, Bob? I think about when we first walk in a radio station, we disinfect the tables and everything. Right, they're convenient, and I always think of one wipe per swipe. Very good. <laughs> As I think some people try to stretch them too far and try to clean too much. And a rule of thumb is when you wipe it, it should remain wet for uh, at least 60 seconds to 90 seconds. If it's drying out before that time, then it's probably not doing an adequate job of disinfecting. So. Make sure that you kind of watch it and that you use enough wipes that a surface will remain wet for up to a minute and a half. If you do that, I think disinfectant wipes are a great adjunct to the cleaning program because if you're in a patient's room and housekeeping is in there 15 minutes out of the day, someone has got to maintain that that clean and safe environment for the other 23 hours and 45 minutes. So... Everyone that goes in and out of the room, if they're raising and lowering bed rails and touching things in the room, then if they don't use the disinfectant wipes, that's a good time for you to grab one and kind of be the example sometimes because people get busy and they're focused on the clinical side of things, but you have to have the vision that you're going to go after the the bugs that can make people sick. So. Disinfectant wipes are a great additional layer to the housekeeping doing their job once in a 24-hour period. So make sure that uh, things are getting wiped with a disinfectant wipe and keeping things safe. Right. Don't just sit there. Wipe something. Here we go. Hospital privacy curtain or the cubicle curtain. Ooh, what do you think of Bob? I think those are probably the dirtiest things sometimes in the hospital. Right. I'm thinking of seldom cleaned. You're right, Pat. Most people will only wash them if they're visibly soiled. What's visibly soiled to one person may not be to another. But think about everyone that comes in the room and they grab that curtain and pull it back. And sometimes they have gloves on, sometimes they don't. And those curtains can be a great source of microorganisms that hide in that cloth. And it's not something that you can use a disinfectant wipe on to disinfect because disinfectants and disinfectant wipes are meant for hard, non-porous surfaces. Curtains aren't that, and uh, so they need to be laundered more frequently. I think that curtains can provide privacy, but at the same time can provide a source for cross-contamination or cross-transmission. And tests have been done where curtains were put up clean curtains, brand new curtains in rooms, and patients isolated for MRSA or MRSA were not in those rooms, but after 14 days, they came back, took those curtains down, and 25% of the curtains had MRSA on them. And it was from the healthcare workers' hands who were maybe down the hall in the isolation room, and they didn't do a good job of washing their hands or hand hygiene, and then they came in, pulled the curtain back, and they deposited that MRSA on a clean curtain. Uh, so they are a great source of cross-contamination, and they, are, they really need to be laundered more frequently than they are. 
And the three of us are in here shaking our heads. So that's good to know because I think we had a clue that that was the case, but many folks might not think of that. So to watch your health care providers and make sure they're not putting on gloves and then closing the curtain and touching you. So just some basic common sense. Daryl, thank you for joining us today. Who says infection prevention has to be scary? It could be fun. How can our listeners learn more about you and your important book, Infection Prevention for Dummies? Just go to my website, www.darylhicks.com. D-A-R-R-E-L-H-I-C-K-S dot com. Daryl, we look forward to your weekly guest visits as you always have so much usable information to share. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pat. It's been fun. My background is in the insurance and financial services industry, so I've spent years working with businesses throughout the United States to help reduce their insurance costs. If you own a company or are in charge of health care costs, you know how crazy health insurance expenses can be. But what if you could drive down costs by keeping your employees out of the doctor's office or hospital, or at the very least, reducing their time there, therefore reducing expenses? No, I'm not talking about the usual wellness programs that drive employees nuts, attempting to induce them to lose weight and stop smoking. I'm talking about a real-time, immediate way to reduce costs. Listen to the following Jerry the Germ vignette, then contact me. In less than three hours, I will teach your folks about workplace infection hazards, as well as offer strategies to help them get out or stay out of the hospital. I'm Jerry the Germ with a Speak Up and Stay Alive Healthcare and Hospital Safety Snippet just for you. <coughs> Here's our expert, Pat Rulo. Hey, Jerry. Healthcare costs are high enough without adding you to the mix. A hospital stay can affect not only the patient, but the patient's employer. Why? Because of reduced work performance and lost productivity, not to mention increased costs. So what can be done? Invite me to speak. I offer employees a fun way to understand health care and hospital dangers so they know how to get out of the hospital faster, how to avoid hazards such as secondary infections or drug side effects that prolong hospital stays, and I'll uncover secret germy hiding places at work. The evidence shows my health and productivity programs make a real dollar and cents difference to an organization's bottom line. Sorry, Jerry, but you've got to go. Stay safe. Listen to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Tune in every Saturday morning. For more information, go to speakupandstayalive.com. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. I am Pat Rulo, author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, the Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, found exclusively at speakupandstayalive.com. And if you're not connected to the Internet, you can call me directly to order the book, 440-725-5462. Much of the time, I tackle little-known life-threatening hospital hazards in a serious way. And sometimes I include Bob and Joe to lighten the mood and show that we have a fun side. But even though we do silly games like Fear the Wheelchair and our sometimes offbeat radio theater, the underlying theme is to expose you to healthcare dangers and empower you to become informed and to take action. And with that in mind, here we go to lighten the mood segment of the show. Fear the wheelchair. Well, by now, you know that a hospital wheelchair is a high-touch, highly contaminated vehicle that's capable of spreading infections all over the place. So the wheelchair is now this show's representation of all hospital dangers, kind of like our mascot. So here we go, our favorite game of... Fear the wheelchair. Listen, as Joe reads some right or wrong statements, and though even though I can't hear you, shout out your answers along with Bob. Is the statement right? Or is it wrong? Joe? All right, here we go. Right or wrong? Hand sanitizers do not kill the C. diff spore. What do you think, Bobby? Oh, that's right. What do you think, Joe? Uh, Yeah, that's absolutely right. We talk about this all the time because many healthcare providers do not know this. If you or a loved one are in the hospital or nursing home or a rehab facility and someone has C. diff at that location, always insist your doctors and nurses wash their hands with soap and water before they touch you. If they should have the seed of spore on their hands and use the sanitizer only, you are at risk. Remember, it's okay to ask others to do what they know they should be doing and insist that your visitors and guests wash their hands too. This is not something to be taken lightly. Right or wrong, if you have a complaint about a quality of care received in a nursing home, 
you can contact a long-term care representative in each state. What do you think, Bobby? I think that's right. You agree, Joe? No. Oh, there is a word for this. Ombudsman. A long-term care ombudsman are representatives or advocates for residents of nursing homes, board and care homes, and assisted living facilities. Ombudsmen provide information about how to find a facility and what to do to get quality care. They are trained to resolve problems and complaints. So if you have any issues about quality of care, go to LTC, that stands for long-term care, ltcombudsman.org. Here's a lot easier. Go to our free stuff page at the speakupandstayalive.com website and just click on their link. Right or wrong, deep vein thrombosis can occur when sitting in one position for a long period of time. Hmm, Bob? Wrong. What do you think, Joe? I think that one's right, actually. Deep vein thrombosis is when a blood clot forms in a deep vein, especially in the legs. Bob was wrong. Joe is right. Certain surgeries and medical conditions can contribute to deep vein thrombosis, as well as lifestyle factors such as being over the age of 60, sitting or inactivity for a long time, long plane flights or long car trips, extra weight and smoking. So if you are flying or driving a long distance this holiday season, be sure to move around, walk around, and change positions frequently. Right or wrong, all powers of attorney are the same. Hmm, what do you think about that? Oh, that's wrong. You agree, Joe? That's wrong. Yeah, it is wrong. There is a power of attorney for health care and another for your financial needs. Two different documents, both extremely necessary for anyone over the age of 18. Right or wrong, each year, one in every three adults age 65 and older takes a fall. How about that, Bob? I think that's wrong. You agree, Joe? I think that's wrong, too. Oh, no. Sadly, that is right. And according to some recent studies, 2.3 million non-fatal fall injuries are among older adults who were treated then in emergency departments, and more than 662,000 of these patients were hospitalized. So, folks, let's do everything to fall-proof all of our homes because we do not want to end up in a hospital for something that is largely preventable. Right or wrong, we believe in the miracle of microfiber. (laughs) <laughs> what do you think, Bob? Oh, that's right. I believe in that. <laughs> yeah, it's a trick question. Oh. <laughs> yes. And when it comes to cleaning at home, microfiber cloths hold the soil within the pockets of the fiber and doesn't release it until it gets washed. It actually picks up 99.99% of soil. Then there's not much left on the surface for bacteria and germs to live on. Germs need food and water to live. So if you use microfiber to clean first, there's not much of that invisible feast for the bacteria to eat. We did pretty good today for a change, you guys. We must be getting smarter. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that, there. that's laughable. Remember, the more you know, the safer you'll be. And you heard about it here on Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Well, thanks, guys, for playing everyone's favorite game. Fear the wheelchair. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. I am Pat Rulo, where the boys and I are keeping you safe during any health care or hospital encounter. Coming up, ooh, what's that on your lipstick? Stay in your seat. <laughs> Today's O Moment is from our friends at the Hospice of the Western Reserve. Listen as I spend two minutes with Lisa Gallagher, their Director of Volunteer Services. Tis the season to share your talents with others. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you, Pat. Lisa, are there any types of specific skills and roles that are especially in demand? Actually, we can never have enough volunteers. Volunteers being involved in hospice is part of our philosophy because hospice work began by the work of volunteers. Back in the early 80s, when Medicare created the hospice benefit, they sat down with folks that were doing hospice work and said, what is this concept and what is most important? And one of the things that was essential is that volunteers were integral and part of hospice work, and they wanted that to continue. So there's actually a regulation that states that 5% of patient care must be done by volunteers, meaning that we can never have enough 
about volunteers. And when you talk about what roles do volunteers do that we are in need of, I think about the massage therapists that provide such a wonderful comfort to patients during their final days. And we have about nine or ten massage therapists who volunteer their time. We could use more licensed massage therapists. Another licensed group that we can use are the hairdressers because it does require a license to cut somebody's hair or style it. And again, when somebody is at their final days, it really does have a lot of comfort and make them feel a lot of dignity, really, to have their hair done. And so we are looking for hairdressers as well. Attorneys, we have patients and families who cannot afford to have a simple will done, and so attorneys can provide that support. There's also the very important role of veterans. We are always looking for people who are veterans who are willing to sit and converse and share their stories and listen to the stories of patients who are also veterans. We have found that veterans have some unique needs, and sometimes at the end of life they're going through some very specific life closure issues, and they're often wanting to talk with somebody else who can truly understand who have walked in those shoes. So when we can couple a veteran with somebody else who truly understands, we find that there's often a lot of healing that takes place, and it's very rewarding for both the veteran serving as a volunteer and the person who's a veteran who's a patient. Lisa, it sounds like there's so many wonderful opportunities. How can our listeners find out more? Well, certainly you can call Hospice of the Western Reserve. We have our volunteer office number, and that number is 216 486 6881. I would also encourage you to visit our website, and that is at hospicewr.org forward slash volunteers. And I'm going to encourage all of our listeners today to give Hospice of the Western Reserve a call and volunteer your services. Thanks so much for being here today, Lisa. Thank you, Pat. I'm grateful. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. I am Pat Rulo, your hostess and author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, the Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, available only at our website, speakupandstayalive.com. Well, today's O moment will cause you to say O, because I'm going to make you think about something you have probably not thought about. Ew, what's on your lipstick? Well, by now, you know that germs and bacteria are all around us. These microorganisms are on and in everything and can easily invade containers that we think are microbe-proof. While you're probably used to associating bacteria with your toilet, floor, or kitchen counter, another area you should be concerned about is your makeup. A leading research organization that publishes studies on the beauty industry recently published a report that highlighted the dangers associated with using outdated cosmetics. As beauty products age, they lose their efficiency. But did you know that outdated products can actually be hazardous to your health? So, what's living in your makeup products and applicators? In laboratory settings, the staph bacteria has been found on lipstick, eyeliner, and eyeshadow. When you think about it, most of our makeup products go around sensitive areas of the face. If the products are full of bacteria, what's to stop those germs from sneaking in through our eyes and nose and mouth? For example, bacteria can live on and enter the body through a mascara wand. If the wand accidentally nicks the eye, and we all know how often we've accidentally stabbed ourselves, the bacteria can cause inflammation, rash, or sepsis, which is an infection that can reach and spread bacteria and toxins through the bloodstream. Then there's MRSA, MRSA. This is one of the most serious forms of staph bacteria that can linger in old makeup. MRSA bacteria can enter the body easily through makeup application and is often characterized by inflammation at the site of exposure and has been known to cause dermatitis and pink eye infections. It can also show as a rash or an acne-like skin condition. However, it can develop into boils and even spread to the bloodstream, causing serious damage and even death in rare cases. So how does makeup become contaminated? It's not as complicated as you may think. Many of these microbes live on our skin already, even when we are healthy. So every time you expose makeup to the applicator, rub it on your skin, and then go back to the product, you are dunking fresh bacteria into it. Compare that to double dipping a potato chip in a bowl of salsa. How can contamination be avoided? Most products have preservatives to help stave off excess bacterial growth, but to be on the safe side, you should always follow these rules. For lipstick... 
Absolutely under no circumstances should you share lipstick or lip gloss. These products harbor bacteria, which can be transmitted from person to person. You can actually catch herpes from using an infected person's lipstick. And since some people show no signs, such as cold sores, you wouldn't even know that you were immediately infected. You can also shave off the top of your lipstick with a blade to eliminate bacteria. Or you could put lipstick in the freezer overnight to kill bacteria, or you can dip it in isopropyl alcohol for 15 to 20 seconds. What about mascara? Again, never share your mascara. Throw away products past their expiration date or those more than a year old. Mascara should be changed even more often between three to six months. And don't pump the mascara. This actually introduces more air into the product and creates a breeding ground for bacteria. You can also put mascara in the freezer overnight if you want to kill bacteria. Then what about powdered eyeshadows and cake foundations? All you have to do is take a tissue and wipe off the top layer of the product in order to sanitize it. Some experts recommend that you purchase a bottle of 95% isopropyl alcohol that you can get at the drugstore and then a small spray bottle. And after or before each use, spray your eyeshadow, your cake blush, or your powder and let it dry. I haven't tried that yet, so I don't know if it alters the texture of the makeup. So here's a few more random tips. Obviously, wash your hands properly before you start a makeup and again after you finish. And drying your hands is equally important. Damp hands spread germs. You can sharpen your eye and lip pencils often to remove surface bacteria. Use diluted bleach to clean non-makeup products such as eyelash curlers and makeup sharpeners. And keep all lids tightly closed and throw out any products with lost lids. You can use disposable applicators and wash your brushes with hot water and soap at least once a week and let them air dry. You can purchase makeup in tubes. Avoid makeup in jars or pots where you have to repeatedly stick your fingers in the container. And throw away any product that smells bad or if the ingredients have separated. And don't blow on your brushes or makeup. This blows spit and germs all over them. And finally, wipe down your makeup bag with sanitizing or alcohol wipes at least once a week. Oh, and I'd be concerned about the cleanliness of department store makeup counters or beauty salons that offer makeup touch-ups after a haircut. Um, no thanks. Well, obviously, dirty makeup is not a major health hazard, but in some instances, it very well could be. When it comes to staying healthy and out of the hospital, I'll freeze my lipstick any day. Well, today we talked about conducting a risk assessment when we visit an elder loved ones during the holiday. Check for opportunities for falls. A safe, fall-free environment is one of the best ways for an older adult to stay out of the hospital. And our guest, Daryl Hicks, consultant and author of the book, Infection Prevention for Dummies, joined our playful side as we discussed some serious word associations. And I gave you a brush up on makeup. Remember to sanitize your makeup and think twice before sharing with others. Let me extend a special thank you to some of the beautiful people who helped to sponsor this program. Hospice of the Western Reserve, the attorneys at Schraff and King, and Daryl Hicks, Infection Prevention for Dummies. I appreciate their expertise, and I certainly encourage everyone listening to support the efforts of these fine folks. And listen next week when we gather together to play Dr. Germ's Word Association. What am I talking about? You'll just have to come back and tell your friends about us. That's next Saturday morning where you can find us two times. Yeah, that's twice. From 7 to 8 Eastern on AM 1420 WHK. And from 9 to 10 Eastern on AM 1220 WHKW. Or you can listen live via the internet on whkradio.com at 7 and on whkwradio.com at 9. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful healthcare and hospital encounters. The information provided in today's broadcast is for informational purposes only and was not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem or as a substitute for consulting a licensed medical professional. Participating as a program listener, guest, or caller should not be considered medical advice. References to any entity, product, service, website, or source of information should not be considered as an endorsement. If you missed part of today's show or just want to share the information with friends, you can download a copy of the show at speakupandstayalive.com that's speakupandstayalive.com want even more information purchase a copy of pat's book at the speak up and stay alive website once again it's speakupandstayalive.com 
This is Pat Rulo. When you get a chance, become a friend and like us on Facebook. We're called Speak Up and Stay Alive. Then post your questions and comments on our Facebook wall. We may read them next week. Who else do you know who can benefit from this life-saving information? You can keep your group, club, business, or church safe from hospital hazards. I speak live and in person, too. Our events are fun, fast-paced, interactive, and jam-packed with serious information. Your crowd will love it. Just email me at speak at speakupandstayalive.com or call 440-725-5462. Until next week, remember to ask others to wash their hands. You have to speak up and stay alive. Call me, email me. Oh, 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 oh,